in uh, Luke 33 through 5, 33 through 38 today. We are looking at the parable of the old and new. So last week we kind of had our introduction to the parables, and this week we're going to kind of look at our first parable. I'm going to try to take a kind of chronological look at the parables and, and see how Jesus, how they naturally kind of flowed in his ministry. Uh, I'm going to try, because it's kind of hard to pay put them in the right chronological order, and uh, you know, I may mess up, I'm human, right? Uh, so we're going to try, that's how we're going to try to look at the parables, and so I talked a lot about earlier our connect groups, and that's part of our three core values is uh, connect, cultivate, and community, and so I would encourage you to, to get into a connect group, or, or even start a connect group if you want, and uh, get together with some, some believers and other like-minded Christians, and and invite people that maybe don't know Christ into your home or into a school or a, a coffee shop or wherever you want to have your small group and connect with God and each other, cultivate or grow your faith, and then reach out into the community. And so today we'll be in Luke 5, 33 through 38. And if you're there, can I get an amen? Amen. amen. All right. If we could, let's go to the Lord. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. If you would, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the truth. Found in your word, and as I preach your word, may these not be my words, may these be your words, and hide me behind the cross today. We love you, we ask all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus, amen. amen. So today we're going to be looking at the idea of this old and new, this idea of, of old things and new things. But before we kind of dig into it, generally, Jesus, uh, and for the most part, Jesus' kind of parables are, are answers to questions. Uh, they're often in response to a question or an accusation. In our parable today, we kind of really have both, right? A, a question and an accusation. Have you ever really been asked a question, but you know where the person's really kind of getting at, right? Uh, so they ask something, and, and, and you know, it's like, really, come on. Uh, if you've noticed, Beth and Megan have really kind of lost a lot of weight. Me? No, not so much. I mean, I've lost like 20 pounds. There's nothing to sneeze at, but but nearly not as much as them. And so oftentimes we'll, we'll meet somebody and they'll be like, man, you guys have lost a lot of weight. And then they kind of look at me, you know, and it's like, I'm like, come on, really? I mean, I, I'm not as committed as them. You have to kind of rub it in. But, you know, we get these questions, right? And we get these times in our lives where people really ask uh, uh, questions, you know, uh, you know, Beth and Megan are losing weight, but what about you? And it's kind of like, mm, really? Uh, you know, or, or you have siblings, or you have family members, and like, your brother and sister are doing really good in school, and then they look right at you, right? Uh, and you're like, ah, okay, I get it. Yeah. And so we see this here, right? We see uh, that they're asking this question, but they're really kind of insinuating some other things. They're really kind of talking about some other things. And so here's the question. It, it's really, uh, it really kind of boils down to this kind of religious uh, lifestyle and, and this religious manner of living. And so we're going to look today at these three questions. Uh, we're going to look at the question, we're going to look at the answer, and then we're going to look and see uh, the parable of the old and new because it's drawn out from these two questions. So, so next slide, uh, I kind of went back on you. It's all right. So in essence, what the question is, is why don't they fast? And so we see that here in this verse, they say John's disciples often fast and pray. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. 
but yours go on eating and drinking, right? Uh, so they, they're essentially talking to Jesus here, and they say, look, your cousin, remember how John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins, right? Uh, so your cousin here, he, he, he's doing these things, right? And, and his disciples, and he's teaching them how to fast, and he's teaching them how to do these things. And, and my, our disciples, uh, you know, the Pharisees' disciples, they're, they're fasting, and, and they're doing the right things. But, but what about your guys? What are they doing, right? Why are they... Why don't they fast? And I like how it says here, it's this idea, they don't even really say, why don't they fast? What do they say? But yours go on eating and drinking, right? Right. So it's not only are they not fasting, but it's just like, psh, they, they don't care. They're continuing to eat and to drink. And, and so it's like, you ever been around a bunch of parents, and, and when our kids were little, this would happen sometimes, right? So the parents are around, and, and they're, they're all gathered around, maybe at a park or something, and, and, and you're in this group, and, and you're kind of like, oh, uh, these guys, I'm friendly with these guys, but I don't, I don't know. And so you're in the, with the parents, and they're talking like, oh, you know, you know, Tommy is in private school, and he's got straight A's, and he plays the violin, and uh, you know, he's a member of the so-and-so club, uh, and you're like, oh. And then the other parent's like, yes, my... My student, my child is an all-star in basketball or, or soccer or, you know, uh, and, and, and then they're the best in everything. And, and if your kids are like mine, they're over there spinning around in, in circles and you're just going, please don't throw up. Please, please don't throw up, right? And so here it is, you know, John's disciples, they're, they're doing the right thing and they're fasting. And, and they do the right. And our disciples, they're, they're fasting. And they're doing the right thing. But yours, man, they're still eating. And they're drinking. And, and what, what is the deal here? So the question is really not so much a question as it is an accusation. Don't you understand? Don't you get what is going on here? That, that these things you have to do, these things you should do, uh, these things are things that we've kind of grown accustomed to. And, and so they're saying you need to kind of follow these rules and these regulations. Now, if you look around, we are meeting in a school, right? Um, and, and this is intentional. We want to have a low overhead. We want to be in a place where people feel comfortable. It's not your typical church with a building. And so we're looking to cast certain uh, people and to draw people in. I, I don't preach in and a suit or a tie. This is done on purpose. Uh, we're trying to do certain things. And so sometimes when I meet with pastors and they're like, where is your office? I'm like, at my house. And they go, well, where do you meet at church? At school? And they're kind of like, Psh, right? The, it, don't you get it? Don't you understand that you have to do these things? You have to do these rules and these fasting and this education. But notice what Jesus teaches about fasting. In Matthew 6, 16, he says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And so this idea of fasting is, it wasn't done to get attention, right? Jesus says, look, you do it to put on oil. You make yourself look like everything's going on. You don't go, whoa, it's me. I'm fasting. I'm hungry. So if they're doing fasting right, they shouldn't even know that John's disciples were fasting. The Pharisees shouldn't even let it known that their disciples were fasting. See, the Old Testament required to fast only once a year at the Day of Atonement. It was the time to fast. The Pharisees required fasting twice a week. But yet fasting became this idea of this religious work or this religious system. But yet now fasting, as Jesus taught it, as we see in modern Jesus' life, is more of a time to refocus, a time to get our attention back on God. And, and my guess is this is probably what it should have been the whole time, right? It's this idea that this is a time for us to refocus and to see what God wants us to do. And so fasting wasn't this religious principle or religious thing. Jesus says, look, the question isn't really a question. It is, but it's more of an accusation. So Jesus says, well, let me give you this answer, 
Passover, right? So they asked the question, look, John's disciples are fasting, and our disciples are fasting, but you guys just eat, like they're at a buffet, right? And they're just eating, and they're eating, and they're drinking. How dare them? And Jesus then says, all right, here's the answer I'm going to give you. And he says, he says, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. So Jesus' essential question or answer to their question is, look, the bridegroom is here, right? This thing that you've been building up to, this Messiah that you've been building up to, this time where Jeremiah prophesies, where you're getting a new heart and a new, new mind and, and this new covenant with God and this new relationship with God and this new uh, everything and this new relationship, how things move and transform. Everything is coming. This rejoicing that the bridegroom is here, this long away to Messiah. Look, I'm here. And this is the time not to be fasting and not to be somber, but this is the time where we rejoice because the bridegroom is here. Now, we do weddings a little bit different in our society than they did it back then, all right? So take out the whole arranged marriage thing, which is kind of a bummer, all right? Um, unless you just happen to, to get the person you like and love, all right? But take out the whole arranged marriage things. They, they knew how to have a wedding. All right, and even if you go to like a, a modern day Jewish wedding, I mean, they, they still kind of know how to throw down at weddings, right? And they know how to party at weddings. Uh, and so I love uh, doing weddings and officiating weddings. And, and there's always some point at a wedding where it's time I look at Beth and I'm like, it's time to go. Because <laughs> right? yeah, things are about to get a little out of hand. But they don't last weeks, right? And so this back then was like, it was like a week long festivity. The whole town came out. Uh, it, was a, it was a party of all parties, right? And it was a time to celebrate the, the coming together of two families. And they had presents. They had this, this dowry they paid. And, and the whole system, whole elaborate thing. But the idea was that the bridegroom is here. That he is coming and he is receiving his bride. And it is a time of rejoicing. And in fact, we'll see later on in some parables that this has some Messiah implications. This has some, some God coming to earth implications. And so Jesus says, look, don't you understand? We all know about weddings. They're talking to this first century audience. And he says, look, this idea of a wedding, we kind of understand and we kind of get. And I think all of us can kind of understand it, even how we've changed it a little bit, right? We sit there and we, we celebrate the wedding and we celebrate the, the bride coming down and everybody rises and stands, right? Can you imagine if you're at a wedding and your wife, the, the bride comes down and everybody's like, oh, here she comes, right? I mean, you know, that's kind of like the idea of the fasting, right? Oh, I got to go to God and I can't eat and, and I'm hungry. And part of my problem with Megan and Beth is I kind of like food, right? Uh, now, some people don't. Some people, it's a necessity for them. But I kind of like eating. And so for me, fasting is not only focusing on God, but it's like a, a punishment almost, right? I look at it as like, dang, you know, I can't eat this or that. And so when you fast, you don't go, oh, I got to fast again. But it's, it's a, I turn to God and I draw to God. It's like it's time for us to rise and to focus on the one that is important. Now, we've shifted and a lot of uh, the attention of the wedding now is on the bride. Uh, back then, the shift in the attention was on the bridegroom. It was the groom, right? And so he would come in, and they would rejoice, and they would have a party, and his friends would be with them. And so Jesus says, look, you fast because you don't quite understand, right? It, it's time the bridegroom is here. I'm here. It is time for my friends and me and my disciples to eat to celebrate, to have a good time because we are seeing what is really happening here. That this one that we have waited for has finally arrived. And so he's trying to show them that there is a reason to celebrate. And so he says, look, there's a time when they will fast. And when it comes to that time, they will fast and, and you'll understand. And so this time that he's talking about is the time between the cross and the resurrection. He's talking about the time where Jesus is gone. 
And he says, then will be a time for us to fast. Then will be a time for us to draw near to God, to look to God, to seek guidance. And once Jesus comes back to life, he lives with them, and he moves with them, and he talks with them. And then when he is ascended to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit as a comforter to live within us. And so there is this time for his disciples to fast. And he says, there will be a time when it comes that they will fast. So his answer to them was, look, it's not the time because the bridegroom is here. You may fast, but my disciples, they understand. So we have the question, we have the answer, and then he gives his parable, right? This is the parable of the old and the new. And we've talked about this a little bit last week, that parables are essentially kind of earthly stories with a heavenly message, right? And, and we, sometimes we can get kind of a little allegorical with it, like every single thing has to have a meaning, right? Or every single thing, and that's not really the case often with it. Uh, it's not an allegory, it's not a, uh, you know, a parable so much as it is this, this grand teaching. And so we see that Jesus is pointing to two things here, right? He's pointing to, to wineskins, and he's pointing to patches. And he says, look, there is this idea that you can understand from real life. And that's generally what a parable is. Uh, something from real life, something that you and I can relate to, something that we know and we see and we understand. And then he says, but then it has this principle on top of it. So let's kind of look at this idea of the old and the new. And so Jesus says we have this patch uh, and we have this wine skin. And I'll reread it to kind of refresh our memory here. It says here, he says, he told them this parable. And I like when the Bible tells you it's a parable, right? It's kind of, it makes my job a little bit easier, okay? He says, now this is a parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Well, duh, right? I mean, that just kind of makes sense, right? You know, you don't take your, your old clothes and you patch the new one with it. And so we see the common sense here, right? So we have this old thing that needs to be repaired. You don't take and break down the new one to fix the old one. He says, otherwise they will have torn the new garment, which is ruined now, and the patch for the new one will not match the old one because the old one is fade and worn. So we kind of see the common sense here, right? You know, you don't take this patch from something new and apply it to something old. And then he says, and no one pours new wine into old Wine skins. Now, I don't drink wine. Beth and I don't drink. Um, and, and so, I, and if we were to drink, I don't think they sell wine and wine skins anymore, right? Um, so, so we not. Uh, I, I, maybe you understand this, and I had to look this up. Um, and so he says, you don't put old wine skins into old wine into new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. I didn't know that was an issue, right? I didn't know that was a problem, right? If you're going to get wine nowadays, I assume that it comes in a bottle, unless you're kind of on a budget and it comes in a box in a bag, right? <laughs> uh, and so this idea then is if you pour new wine into an old wine skin, it's going to literally explode. And, 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 and these wine skins were called wine skins for a reason because they were actually animal skin, right? And, and so... Good times, right? Uh, we're, we got to think back to this time, right? And so how are you going to hold your wine? Well, you're going to get some old animal. You're going to clean up uh, a body part of it. You're going to clean it out. And you're going to dump some wine in it, okay? And so he says, look, you don't take new clothes and fix old patches. You don't take new wine and put it in old wineskin. But he has to be kind of talking about something deeper here, right? He has to be talking about something kind of more important, right? And, and so he's talking about this idea of the old and the new. Now I have, or I used to, I don't really have this, this dream slash nightmare anymore. I had it for a while. I had this old dream nightmare, right, that I got this phone call and, and it happened several times and I don't know, well, maybe I had some issues or something, I don't know, but, but I get this call or a letter or some kind of uh, notification from my old high school that I missed a credit or two and that I had to go back to high school and finish high school. Now look, high school for me wasn't bad. It wasn't like I was bullied, uh, you know, and it wasn't great. It wasn't like the king of the high school, but I, I had fun in high school. 
but I don't want to go back, right? Uh, and and it's, it's old for me now, right? And, and it's, it's, I'm done with it. And I don't want to take this new person who I am and go back to the old. Beth and I, uh, this is a while back, we visited back where I grew up. And I ran into a couple people. And, and they're like, you know, just like you do when you talk to people, they're like, so what do you do for a living? And I told them, well, I'm a pastor. And they kind of laughed. They're like, no, really, what do you do for a living? I'm like, no, really, I'm a pastor. And if you would have known me in high school, that, that wouldn't have worked out real well, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so this is a new Kevin. You don't take the new Kevin and put the, with the old Kevin, right? And so this is this idea. If we look at the context around the verse, okay? If we look at the context and we see the understanding, because remember, context helps us determine meaning. We did a little series back where we looked at all the commercials and, and how the context of the commercial changes and it's different, right? So in Luke 5, 21, there are these series of questions, these three questions that they ask Jesus. And I think it builds up to this idea of old and new. In Luke 5, 21, it says, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Ooh, that's a hard word. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? How can you forgive sin? I'll tell you the story here. So if you remember your Bible stories or maybe you're not familiar with it, Jesus is preaching. The friends come and they lower down the guy on the mat or they bring the guy in the mat. And he says, get up. Your sins have been forgiven and you're healed. And they freak out, right? Because you can't do this. Who in the world forgives sins? Who in the world heals these quests, heals people? And so they're trying to wrap their mind around about who exactly Jesus is. And so this is the first question. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? You can't be God. You can't be healing people. You can't be claiming to be God. Who can forgive sins but God alone, right? And this is one of those questions slash accusations, right? Well, of course, they know only God can forgive sins, and only God alone can do it, and, and, and homeboy, you aren't God, right? And so how can you claim, how can you forgive sins? So we see this idea, right? And the first question, how can you forgive sins? The next question is, after that scene, Jesus goes and he, he brings Levi in, right? And, and we talked a little bit about this, this follow me, right? Remember, Levi is at this tax booth. He says, follow me. And Levi goes, okay. And he leaves, right? And he follows Jesus. And then he says, who do you eat and drink with? Tax collectors and sinners. Or, sorry, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? How can, you, how can you be with sinners? How can you hang out with sinners? Remember, Levi throws this lavish party. And Jesus is there. They're doing, they're eating. And they're drinking, remember? <coughs> And they're, they're with Levi, and they're with all his friends and the sinners, and they see him, and they're like, how can you do this? How can you forgive sins? How can you be around those that aren't of the same mindset and of the same likeness as us, right? And he says, why do you eat with sinners and tax collectors? And then Luke 5, 33, we get our question. Why don't they fast? Why don't they do these things? See, what Jesus is leading up to is Jesus is saying, look, there is this old way. There is this old thing, right? There is this old way of doing things. And, and we see here that this fasting had become part of their religious movement and part of their religious process and part of their religion of, of fasting and going to prayer. And, and remember, it was just one time in the Old Testament, and the Pharisees amped it up. And Jesus is saying, look, this old religion with its old rules and its old regulations, it, it's, it's, it's old for a reason, right? And this new that I've come to do, this new that I've come to create and to fulfill as part of that old religion, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, the fulfillment of all the things that have been building up to it. Remember, this is one story from Adam and Eve to Revelation of Jesus. is one grand story of God moving in people's lives. And so Jesus comes and he says, I am this new patch. You don't take it and replace it with the old, right? You don't take this new and put it in with the old because then it'll explode and it'll, it'll destroy everything. 
You have this newness that comes and completes it and fulfills it. You don't have these old rules and regulations anymore, but you have this newness. And so we see the parable of the old and the new. And Jesus says the old is there. The old is the fasting, the temple, the, the Pharisees, the, the, the garments, all the regulations, all the other things that they had. The new is the cross, grace, and mercy. And he says that is what this parable is about. It's about showing the contrast between the old and the new. So why don't you take the patch from the new and replace it in the old thing? It just ruins it. Why would you take new wine and put it in old wineskins? And Jesus says, look, I am here. The bridegroom is here. My disciples don't fast because they understand that the Messiah is here. The one that is going to forgive you of your sins. The one that is going to make all things new. The one that has come to, to fulfill all the prophecies, to complete the religion that you follow. It's here. It's time to party. It's time to to rejoice because of everything that your forefathers have waited for is now here. There'll be a time to fast, but that time isn't now. So I want to leave you with this idea of, of this cross connection and, and this application of how do we take this and apply this to our lives. And I'm, I'm going to have a question for you. And, and you can take it as a question and an accusation if you want, and I don't really mean it that way. I just kind of want it to, to float it out there. Are you trying to fit your new in the old? Whatever your new is, maybe you are a new Kevin like me, and, and, and you're trying to fit the new you into your old lifestyle. Maybe your new is that you've committed to, to doing something new. Maybe you, you've been a, a Christian for a while, and and you're struggling with something, and, and, and why are you trying to stop drinking and keep going to bars? Why are you trying to stop uh, looking and oogling at women or, or looking at pornography but still on your computer at night all alone? What are you trying to fit this newness into the old? And Jesus says, look, if you have this new thing, then why would you ever go back to the old way. And we see here that, that we are new creations. We are born again. We are new people in the faith. And God makes us. Uh, he transforms us. And in this process, he's creating us, molding us into his image. And what are you trying to fit your new into the old? And what are you trying to put your newness back into? And, and is it working out real well? And chances are it's probably not. So my challenge would be to you to, to accept this newness. To, to accept your new way of life, your new thinking, your new birth, your new transformation, your new creation. That was brought to you by Jesus on the cross. That, that this perfect and sinless man that was born to a virgin that died on the cross for you and for me and for our sins to be forgiven. And how can we take this gift and this grace and this mercy and try to fit it back into the old? If you would, let's pray.